Pokemon Sword and Shield introduced the very first poison type legendary 23 years after Pokemon first launched, the only type that didn't have a legendary associated with it. And despite general opinions about the Gen 8 games, what a debut that was. An eldritch abomination resembling Ultra Beast laying dormant for 20,000 years, now constantly expending energy at a rate too much for our feeble human bodies to comprehend, warping space and time around us. And with the first DLC, the teal mask dropping for Scarlet and Violet, I was excited to hear the fact that we got a whole new legendary trio, all sporting the poison type. It's finally poison's turn in the spotlight. They've been neglected for far too long. And with an entrance like Eternatus, the sky's the limit for what poison type legendaries could represent. Right, these are the same people that designed the future paradox forms. Let's go back. Alright, I'll admit, I was pretty disappointed when they were first revealed. Poison's not my favourite type, but I still want to see it succeed. Well, Pheasant Dippity looks cool at least. But despite their lackluster appearances, what I was interested in was their lore. I'm always a fan when newly introduced legendaries are actually given a backstory or a mission to get them, rather than them just being there. Or even worse, just having the literal god of the Pokemon universe being FedEx to you by a random delivery person. I wonder what his lore is. You already know the rules of a hardcore Nuzlocke, but to summarize, if a Pokemon faints, it's no longer usable, we can't use items in battle, we can't overlevel past the next gym, and we'll have to do all the boss fights up until the level cap before challenging the gym, and we'll be playing on set mode. Now the Teal Mask Legendary has got the Urshifu treatment, where rather than getting the standard base stat total of 580 that sub-legendaries typically get, they actually have around 550, resembling the BST of some of the stronger regular Pokemon such as King Gambit, Ursaluna, Volcarona, Arcanine, and Florges. What's Florges doing with all that BST? apparently wasting it in its special defense. And like other legendary trios, all their stats are spread so that they each do something a little different. Okie Doki is the physically bulky and strong poison fighting type, a pretty straightforward role where he can pick up KOs while taking a few physical hits. His speed isn't too bad either. Then we have Monkey Dory, a rare poison psychic type, only sharing its type with the Galarian Slowbro and Slow King. This one is a very standard fast special attacker, not really much to say. Then we have Pheasantipity, Poor Festendipity. While being my favourite design wise, also having a solid rare typing, Poison Fairy, shared only by Galarian Weezing, it was cursed with the Articuno stat spread. This basically means that there's a bunch of points dumped into its special defence, with the remaining stats ranging from mediocre to bad, meaning it doesn't even really benefit from the one stat it excels at. Floor just has some company. And lastly, we have Ogapon, but we'll talk about this little murder gremlin laser. Well, despite me saying this, Pheasantipty solos the entire first gym. Not too impressive considering they're all bug types which is four times resistant to, but we are actually able to sweep a sizable portion of the game's first half with little to no resistance. It's been a while since I've been able to pull off such a feat in a legendary only run. Okie Dogi gets the move bulk up right off the bat, meaning with its already impressive physical bulk, it can start setting up attack and defense boosts. I made a conscious decision to not exceed either stat by two boosts unless we have no other choice. This strat was also enough to solo the first Tyson Clawth, who's weak to fighting types, and Brassius, who's weak to poison types. I was talking down Pheasantipity, but he also put in decent work against the Tyson Bombardier. Being a fairy type, being able to get off super effective damage, but primarily being there to use charm, halving their physical attacks. The loyal trio also got a brand new ability, Toxic Chain, which has a 30% chance to poison opponents whenever an attack is used against them. This works with any damaging attacks, making this a much better poison touch. Pheasantipity was proving to be a good user of it. I had Monkey Dory come in to finish up as Bombardier has no dark moves, but Pheasantipity did most of the heavy lifting. The first team star base was a clean sweep with Okie Dogi. His idle animation makes me feel uncomfortable. But as with all of my runs, Iona needs a little bit more strategizing than just having a one month sweep. I grabbed the Swords Dance TM from near the Tyson Bombardier fights and taught this and Trailblaze to Ogapon. None of the loyal trio have a type advantage against Electric, so at least she can resist their attacks. I start off with Monkey Dory, who can make quick work of Waterall, and then can absorb Luxio's Intimidate. It's a special attacker, so we just stay in to finish it off with a couple of side beams. Luxio did get off a super effective bite, so Monkey Dory is weak when Belly Bolt comes out, but we need a target dummy to let our goblin set up on. Unfortunately, even after a Swords Dance, doubling our attack, Trollblaze only did just less than half, making Belly Bolt a 3 hit KO, which was long enough for it to get off a of Paralysis, something I could have very easily played through by equipping a very common berry, but I 
have zero foresight. So now Miss Magius is not going to be the easy one shot I was hoping. I have to switch out now as we no longer outspeed and Miss Magius has the move Hex, which doubles in power if a statist, which, you know, we are. So come on Pheasant Dipsy, time to flaunt that special defense. That was very disappointing. We get confused and I try going for a poison tail to double the chances of us landing poison on Miss Magius. We hit ourselves. Alright, save for one more turn. Miss Magius gets the special attack boost, which is terrifying. And we land Poison Tail, with Toxic Chain triggering. Now we just need to stall turns, but with the boost, even that could be an issue. I can take one more Hex, but a self-hit would kill. And Pheasantipity breaks through. Another Poison Tail, that even crits. Poison will kill the next turn, meaning we can just switch out to Okie Doki to tank, as the Poison finishes off Miss Magius, getting us the third badge. Did Pheasantipity just save the run? Well, Okie Doki could have survived another attack, so we would have won regardless, but who was it that got the initial Poison off? Well, from one of the harder battles in this game, we go straight to the next. The second team star boss, Mela, uses Fire-type Pokemon, and we are very ill-equipped to deal with Fire-types. Again, the loyal trio have no advantage over Fire-types, but now even our other Pokemon, Grass-type Okapon, is weak to it, making her fairly useless here. Mela even gets the advantage, setting up the Sun with Torkoal's ability, powering up Fire-type moves. So, I'm not sure if this is a bug, but Rain started before the battle, and Torkoal's ability still triggered activating the sun. However, the overview screen still shows us that Rain is active, so I'm hoping that this is correct and not a visual bug. I mean, mechanically, Torkoal's drought should absolutely take precedence, it would be stupid otherwise, but the Rain would help us out big time. Well, Fake Out and Psybeam does over half, and Torkoal's Flame Wheel does about half. This really tells me nothing about whether the effects of Rain are active or not. Anyway, it doesn't really matter here, it dies the next turn. Out comes the Starmobile. I bring in Pheasantipity, Blazing Torque doing about half and I still can't tell. I mean, all of these Pokemon are fairly bulky, and both Torkoal and the early Starmobiles aren't that strong. Well, we can survive one more, as it goes for Screech, halving our defense, as we use a charm, halving its attack. We can survive anyway, so eat a Blazing Talk and use one more charm. Now we can switch into Okie Dogi, as Revivroom uses an Overheat, doing a lot of damage, but also halving its special attack. And then set up two bulk ups, as Okie Dogi gets burned. Something I could have also easily prevented by equipping a berry. I didn't. So now while its attacks don't do much, we're taking burn damage every turn, and also our attack is halved. Okie Dogie can no longer win the one-on-one, -on -one, so I have to bring out Monkey Dory. We can tank attacks now, so we can use three side beams as the last blazing talk burns us. And Monkey Dory survives on just two HP. I don't know why I'm playing so risky. But now all of our loyal trio are weakened, so we have to rely on the one goblin we said would be at a disadvantage. Into Ogre Pond, who eats the blazing talk. Not getting burned. I use a Swords Dance to double our attack to ensure that we at least do some damage if we get burned. We do not. And Low Sweep just misses the kill. I knew I should have taught it a ground move. Ogapont's still able to eat the final one, however, landing another low sweep, ending the Starmobile. That was so close to a wipe, and I honestly got lucky. If you don't count Okie Dogie getting burned early. Yeah, I played that horribly. So many ways I could have prepared for this fight that I was just too lazy to do, like collecting berries or defeating enough trainers to get the TM for Stomping Tantrum. I don't really have an excuse, but despite it being a close win, it was indeed a win. And I think these are usually the hardest battles in the first half of the game, so it was kind of expected. Only easy sailing from here on, right? Well, while that may have sounded ominous, this next part really is just an easy sweep. Against Kofu, I charm down Veluza's attack, switch into Ogopon to set up a Swords Dance, and whittle away at Veluza using Trailblaze, which also raises her speed. Then I can just outspeed and clean up with Ivy Cudgel, which is Ogopon's signature move with a base power of 100 and a high crit chance. This move will be very important later on. Next I go fight Orthworm, who I should have fought before Kofu, but here we are. He's completely walled by bulk up Okie Dogi. Seeing their face in pain never gets easier. Next up is the next Team Star member, one that almost always gives me trouble. But this time to face the Poison type Team Star boss, we have a team of Poison types ourselves. And this time I actually do collect the TM for Stomping Tantrum and also equip my Pokemon with berries. Skantan can't poison us, and since both of its attacks are resisted, it opts to use Sucker Punch, which is marginally stronger. This means we can safely set up two bulk ups as Sucker Punch fails if we use a non attacking move. I was proven wrong turn two as it uses Venoshock, which only does 10 points of damage. And then we can just outspeed to one shot with Stomping Tantrum. 
Serum. Atticus sought the ground move and yet still sent out his Pokemon four times a week to ground anyway. Well, River Room does have Bulldoze, super effective against us, not doing too much damage. The speed loss probably being a bigger issue. One shot. Next is Muck, who could be annoying as it has Mud Slap, which is super effective and lowers accuracy, but we can still outspeed and one shot. And we're on the bigger River of Room, who with our defense boosts really can't touch us. Spam a few stomping tantrums and that's Atticus down. Nice that this was an easy one for a change. And I'm sorry Larry, I'd love to give you as much screen time as possible, but he is completely walled by bulk up Ogie Dogie, who now also packs Drain Punch to recover back any damage he takes during setup. Even Staraptor with its flying stab doesn't do much with the area lace. Drain Punch. Even Rhyme isn't that concerning, as Pheasantipity is actually quite useful during double battles. I set up a Swords Dance with Ogapon and use an Icy Wind with Pheasantipity, which lowers both Pokemon's speed, activates Toxic Chain on Mimikyu, which is exactly what I wanted, and then breaks its disguise. The speed drop was important, as Baynet does the same thing, so we're all at a speed deficit, meaning it's cancelled out. Mimikyu's the lesser threat, as it has really bad moves, so I target Baynet with Throw Chop for a one shot, and whistle Mimikyu down with Cross Poison. Despite the speed drop, we still outspeed Houndstone, getting another one shot and finish Mimikyu off with the Cross Poison. Now Toxtricity is all by its lonesome, so I'm not too concerned. But even then, I wasn't expecting to outspeed yet again. Throw Shot picks up one final one-shot, earning us the sixth badge. Are you starting to believe the murder allegations? Well, it only gets worse from here. Iron Treads, despite being a ground type with a type advantage against the loyal trio, stands no match against the murderous Microgreen. Well, with Arvin actually attacking and then burning. And then Iron Treads using the worst possible move in that turn. Yeah, the odds were just not stacked in its favor. But next we have a battle I was actually a little wary about. The next gym specializes in psychic Pokemon. A type half of our team is weak to, one doubly so. But this presents the perfect opportunity for Ogapon to establish a dominance over the other pathetic worms pretending to be legendaries. Into our lethal lentil, and she sets up a sword to dance on for a giraffe's zen headbutt. Throat Chop, Ivy Cudgel, Throat Chop, and Throat Chop. Good lord, Ogapon. Well, unfortunately for her, the next gym specializes in ice types who have the advantage over her, even leading with a Pokemon that shares its typing with Bug. Well, she has meat shields for a reason. I don't want Frostmart setting up a Tailwind, so I hit it with a 4 times effective Fire Fang, getting the one shot. Now, Bear takes the perfect Pokemon to set up a couple of bulk ups against, to then just recover back all the damage we take with Drain Punch. Yes, another one shot on Titan. And finally, it's Altaria. We have the same base speed, but with the EVs, we should have the upper hand. Okay, I guess not. Well, it's Altaria, so even a hurricane shouldn't. Okay, that did a lot. I always tend to underestimate how much damage Altaria can do to me. But one more drain punch, one more one shot, and that's the final badge. We have gotten through every gym in about 15 minutes of video time. That is a record for me with these games. I use these Pokemon because I didn't really think they would be that overpowered. And honestly, aside from a certain homicidal habanero, they really aren't. Many teams in this game are just weak to these type combinations. Maybe Okie Dogi more than the other two. But just because we've gotten all the badges doesn't mean that we're anywhere close to the end of the game. Battle content wise, this is only the halfway point. Before we can unleash the deadly Daikon onto the Elite Four, we still have three more battles to take care of. I do this part slightly out of Order, challenging the final Titan first, but as long as we stay within the level cap of 57, it's fine. Even underleveled, Dondoza didn't stand a chance. That was without a boost. This monster had no business getting a move with a high BP and a high crit chance. Tatsugiri being part dragon is slightly more difficult as we don't have a super effective move for him. But after setting up a Swords Dance and then getting another attack boost from Tatsugiri lowering our speed with Icy Wind, triggering the ability Defiant, it only takes two more attacks. Ogapon feels absolutely no remorse for committing first degree murder, knowing no current suit of authority has any chance of bringing her to justice. Next we have the Fairy Top Team Star Boss, and as you can imagine, with three Pokemon strong against Fairy, Ortega was never really going to be a threat. I did try setting up a couple of bulk ups with Okidogi, but Azumarill has charm, which just reduces our attack to nothing anyway. I decided to just accept that my attack's not being raised and finish the zoomer off with a poison jab. Well, despite our attack being lowered, our defense boosts remain, and all of Ortega's Pokemon are physical attackers, so we can just take care of Wigglytuff and Dash Bun with poison jab, and even do some damage to the Starmobile. I do end up bringing out Monkey Dory, and two last large waves brings us closer to the end game. And well, Eri, despite being typically one of the harder bosses in the game, is almost entirely walled by Okie Dogi, with almost her entire team being physical attackers. She leaves with the poison fighting type Toxicroak, and we send out the poison fighting type Ogie Dogie. Toxicroak has no moves to touch us, but instead of setting up, I instead choose to take it out with Stomping Tantrum. There is a reason for this. Next is Lucario, and I spend a minute trying to remember if it adds Psychic. I stay in on the Dragon Pulse and one shot with Drain Punch, restoring back all the damage we took. And we're onto Annihilate, which is always a terrible
terrifying Pokemon to deal with, as it has the move Rage Fist, which increases in damage for every attack Annihilate has taken. We have no Pokemon that resists said move, and the only Pokemon that has super effective moves against it, Pheasantipity, is too weak to do anything. But despite it being resisted, at this current moment, Close Combat is still stronger than Rage Fist, also lowering its defenses. I use this moment to set up our boosts. After two bulk ups and Annihilate taking three defense drops, we can get a clean one shot with a super effective Shadow Claw without any risk of Rage Fist. And now with our two defense boosts, we can just spam Drain Punch, recovering back any damage we take. Passamian goes down easily, but the Starmobile has the ability Stamina, raising its defense for every attack it takes. Not that it can really do much in return, aside from taking way longer to go down than necessary. Eventually it's too much for River of Room to handle, and we get the final badge of the region, and put the final battle before the end game behind us. I decided to do this challenge for two reasons. One, I wouldn't really use these Pokemon under any other circumstances. And two, looking at their stats, they really didn't look like they were anything special. But this entire game is almost entirely walled by a combination of just two of them. I haven't really even been abusing setup moves, having a self-imposed cap of two boosts of battle at most. But with us reaching the final stretch of this game, maybe we can finally see some resistance. Um, well, while I'd like to tell you a story of how I scaled perilous heights, fighting back against all the odds to overcome an overwhelming, grueling, and punishing challenge, that is the Elite Four. It was a massacre. See, with us now being the level we are, we can now sweep through the Teal Mask DLC. And after getting to the end, we unlock some masks for Ogapon. The obvious change is that these masks give Ogapon a secondary typing, and change the type of the move Ivy Cudgel. Hearth Flame into Fire, Wellspring into Water, and Cornerstone into Rock. But there's a secret effect also applied. One that even the competitive battle sim Pokemon Showdown didn't realize until a few days after the DLC was released. Holding any one of these masks gives Ogapon a 20% boost to not only her stabs, but all of her attacks, with no repercussions. As you could tell, she was already kinda doing just fine without this, but power isn't something that she sees a ceiling for. It only exists as a concept for us mortals to measure her rage. But how do we measure that of which we do not understand? Now, I could obviously just ban these masks from my run, but we've already broken this game in half. We may as well see how far her reign of terror can go. Also, Ogapon is holding my family at gunpoint, please help. We unleash our bloodthirsty bean once more, set up a swords dance. I'm sorry, Rika. We one-shot Whiskash with Horn Leech, also restoring back all the damage we took. Next is Donphan, and there's a reason I gave Ogapon the Heart Flame Mask, despite Fire being at a disadvantage against Ground. Each form also gets a different ability. The Heart Flame Mask gives Ogapon the ability Mold Breaker, which allows Moose to ignore the opponent's ability. This means despite Donphan having the ability Sturdy, allowing it to survive one-hit KOs on one HP, Mold Breaker makes this irrelevant. One-shot Dugtrio with Horn Leech. One shot camera up with Stomping Tantrum, and one shot poor Clots out with Horn Leech. Oh god, not a child. Swords Dance. The Fire Type Ivy Cudgel one shots Copperaja. Ivy Cudgel one shots Corviknight. Ivy Cudgel one shots Bronzong. Ivy Cudgel one shots Magnezone by passing Sturdy. And Ivy Cudgel one shots Tinkerton. Oh no. A child sacrifice is something I can live with, but please not Larry too. This time Ogapon puts on a different mask, the Cornerstone Mask. The Rock Type Ivy Cudgel one shots Tropius. Ivy Cudgel one shots Tarapsa. Ivy Cudgel one shots Altaria. Ivy Cudgel one shots Oricorio. That crit was unnecessary, and you know it, you monster. And as poor Larry is forced to terrestrialize Flamigo due to unjust working environments set by Geetha, he loses his fighting typing, getting one shot by Ivy Cudgel. There's no point anymore. Ogapon's mask doesn't just change her own typing to rock, but my heart too. Neuven in sheer terror misses Superfang as Ogapon does a death dance. Killing isn't enough, she needs her opponent to feel pure despair as Neuven misses another Superfang, a 1% chance. Ivy Cudgel. Even Haxorus couldn't survive a neutral attack. Stomping Tantrum one shots Dragalge, and he was able to get off Poison with Poison Point. Truly a feat no other Pokemon managed, especially after she got her boost. But unfortunately, all Flapple can do is buy time for some extra poison damage, as it too falls to a single Ivy Cudgel. Last up is the big Baxcalibur, however, and the poison wasn't entirely in vain. With the damage she's taken, and with Baxcalibur losing its ice type, she likely could not one-shot. Ogapon, for the first time, is forced to run back, mask in between her legs, 
as she will not survive an attack, forcing her minions to come in to clean up. Pheasant Dipsy comes in on the Icicle Crash, restoring his health with a berry. This gives him a turn to outspeed and use Charm, halving Baxter's attack and surviving another Icicle Crash. He can stay in for one more, so I'll play rough does a little over half and even triggers the Poison Chain ability. While he could kill, play rough has a 10% chance to miss, so into Okie Dogi. With the attack drop and his bulk, Okie Dogi eats the Glaive Rush and hits back with a final Drain Punch, finishing Baxcalibur off and getting us through the Elite Four. Sure, the poison didn't help Hassel win, but maybe this is a turning point, a sign that Ogapon's tyranny does in fact have holes in it, that mortals have a chance of standing up against her. Throw chop, Ivy Cudgel, Ivy Cudgel, Horn Leech, Ivy Cudgel, and Horn Leech. My god, she needs to be stopped. After witnessing the slaughter, I felt I saw as much as I needed to when it came to Ogapon. The actual trio needed more of a spotlight. For the next few battles, I decided to seal her away, and this decision was for the best as the next few battles take place at a school, and she's already murdered a child in cold blood. I can't let her take Clive too. First up's Orangaroo, and I let Monkey Dory take the lead as we haven't really seen much of him. Monkey Dory's not bad or anything, it actually has the best stats among the trio, but the rest just have better types suited for this game. Neither Psychic nor Poison are really amazing types, and put together they're still pretty underwhelming. He sets up a nasty plot as Orangaroo yawns. We stay into one shot with Sludge Wave, which doesn't quite work, and Orangaroo uses Foul Play, doing well over half. Well, it was a pleasure, Monkey Dory. Back to the actual useful ones. Dream Eater doesn't work on the Awake Pheasant Dipity, and he outspeeds to finish the job with Cross Chop. Gyarados does have a super effective Earthquake, but we can outspeed to half its attack with Charm first. Earthquake does less than half. We can survive another, so one more Charm. Now into the bulky Okie Dogi, as Earthquake does a pathetic amount. Perfect chance to set up our two bulk ups, and now a Poison Jab one shots Gyarados. A Bomber Snow comes out and sets up Hail, which in this game onwards increases the defense of Ice types, but Drain Punch still one-shots, recovering the damage Okie Doki takes. Unfortunately, Okie Doki isn't too suited for Ghost types, one step being resisted and the other ineffective. So I use Stumping Tantrum instead, just missing the kill. Pulsy Geist gets the speed boost from its ability and then misses Will-O-Wisp. I mean, it can outspeed the next turn anyway, unless it misses again. That was insanely lucky, but I don't think it really changed much. No. If Okie Doki did get burned, Skeledurge may have been slightly more difficult to handle, but now we can get a clean one shot with a plus two super effective stomping tantrum. Or not. It somehow survives and uses a super effective earth power doing over half, but we outspeed so another stomping tantrum finishes Skeledurge off. Turns out Okie Doki not getting burned actually did make a difference. We still have the other two in the back, but I'm glad I wasn't forced to acknowledge Fezendipity's impressive special defense as actually being useful for a change. But just like a speck of mold ruins the loaf. Ogapon's influence has already seeped deep inside us as I have the sudden urge to ruin the dreams and ambitions of a bunch of school children. Despite that, we're off to a rough start as I stand to set up a bulk up on Umbreon, forgetting that it has a 4 times effective psychic, but thankfully attacking is not Umbreon's strong suit as it only does a little over half, a lot of which we just recover back with our berry, then a single drain punch gets the one shot, recovering the rest of our HP. Next is Flareon, who we can just one shot with Stomping Tantrum. Vaporeon's a lot bulkier and even uses a baby doll eyes, outspeeding to lower our attack back to normal. Poison Jab still does over half and even gets the poison, and Penny gives up as we outspeed to finish Vaporeon off with another. Jolteon outspeeds to use Thunder, which misses. I've been getting pretty lucky with these this run. Stomping Tantrum. Poor Leafeon, while outspeeding, only has a weak Leaf Blade to hit us, and a stab Poison Jab gets the one shot or not. I forget that Leafeon has decent physical bulk. Well, we got it for poison, so while it does try to lower our attack with baby doll eyes, we can bring it back to neutral with a bulk up as Leafeon succumbs to poison. And finally it's Penny's last Pokemon, Sylvia Poison Jab. And that's Penny out of the way. I really like the idea of an evolution team, but man they have weaknesses. So I kind of forgot about Arvin. Usually I would have dealt with him first. Arvin leaves with his weakest Pokemon, Greedent, and I stand up Fezendipity. Well, as pathetic as Greedent is, it does have Earthquake, which all of my Pokemon are weak to. So Fezendipity's main job is to charm it down until Earthquake does nothing. Now Okie Dokie could probably sweep, but Monkey Dory really needs to do something. So come on out, buddy. Even with his meager physical defense, Earthquake does little, so we set up a nasty plot doubling our special attack. And now Sludge Wave can pick up the one shot. While Garganeckle is a physical wall, its special defense isn't too shabby either. But one thing I've forgotten is just how high Monkey Dory's special attack really is, as he picks up another one shot. Toad Scroll, like Tentacruel, is pretty specially bulky, and with us not having a super effective attack, it just barely survives the Sludge Wave. But Toxic Chain triggers, Toad Scroll hitting us with the spore. The poison finishes Toad Scroll off, but with Monkey Dory asleep, 
Good hustle, buddy. Insert Okie Dogie on a missed fire blast. I stand to set up a bulk up as Sko Villain uses a four times effective Zen head bus. Why does it even have that? Well, it's pretty frail, so a poison jab picks up the one shot. With the boost, Drain Punch even one shots the physically tanky Cloyster. But next up's Mabostev, and this thing can be pretty scary as it has a super effective move for all of our Pokemon, and likely outspeeds too. It's gonna go for a four times effective Psychic Fangs, and the only Pokemon neutral, Monkey Dory, is asleep. So I do something I've held off up until now. I swallow my pride and terrestrialize Okie Dogie into a fighting type, turning our four times weakness to Psychic into a regular one and psychic fangs barely does anything i didn't even need to do that a boosted super effective drain punch gets the one shot and that's arvin but there is still one more left one who's smug enough to think she's on my level the first one up is lycan rock and i make the mistake of leading with okie dogie staying in for a bulk up as lycan rock uses a drill run this is super effective and has a high chance to crit meaning it could tear through my defense boost to kill we're close to the end anyway, so I risk it and eat a drill run, hitting back with a boosted drain punch, getting the one shot and recovering back a large chunk of HP. I don't really know what Nimona was thinking when she sent out Orthworm. Drain punch. And then she sends out the Dunsparce. I mean, she's probably never seen an Okie Dogie before, but surely she saw him punching her dog square in the face. How dare she disrespect the Dunsparce like that? Well, I mean, it's not like Paul Mort was gonna fare well against him either. But she does do something clever. She uses Double Shock to do a large amount of damage, also getting rid of Paul Mort's electric typing, meaning it survives the stomping tantrum. Not that it can really do anything in the next turn. Drain Punch. Gudra is the first Mon we don't have a super effective attack for, and it should have been the first one she should have sent out. It outspeeds to use Dragon Pulse, doing a lot of damage. And even with our boost, Poison Jab doesn't get the kill, but gets off a poison. We can't survive another, so into Fezendipity on the ineffective Dragon Pulse, and Gudra succumbs to poison. Finally, it's called Quavel, and unfortunately, with it about to terrestrialize into a water type, we don't really have much for it. Aquastep will be boosted as it's a water type, and it also raises its speed, meaning he could sweep if not for a certain vengeful vegetable. She's been lying dormant for far too long. Ogopon comes back, this time donning her Wellspring mask, turning her into a water type, but also giving her the ability Water Absorb, making Aqua Step ineffective. With her outspeeding and Coquavel's strongest attack being Aerial Ace, a whole niche humbles our so-called rival. The way one builds strength is by facing resistance, and with Ogopon having truly nothing left standing in her way, she grows weary of our mortal plane. The only way for her to evolve is by seeking powers outside the grasps of our puny human minds. And thus she sets her sights on a rumored time machine deep within Area Zero. Unfortunately, it's defended by a fool living under a rock, unknowing of the natural disaster standing before him. Ogopon takes one final victim, using the rock-type Ivy Cudgel on Iron Moth, before growing bored, letting her minions take care of the rest. Iron Hands does have Iron Head, but with Pheasant Dipsy outspeeding to use Charm, reducing its attack, it can do very little as we just roost back any damage we take. Until it crits, taking Pheasant Dipsy down from full health and giving us our first death. I actually got kind of attached. He did far better this run than I was expecting after seeing his stats. But with the free switch into the second in command, we can start setting up bulk ups as Iron Hands fires off weak thunder punches. Until one paralyzes us. Why is everything going wrong now? It can now outspeed, still not doing much, but tanks the plus two super effective stomping tantrum. I use Drain Punch to at least recover some HP back. Chura saw me using a ground move and yet still chooses to send out the four times weak Iron Thorns. It outspeeds to use its own ground move, but with our defense boosts, we eat. Stomping Tantrum picks up the one shot. Iron Bundle is a strong special attacker which could have been concerning, but Churo throws, setting up a snowscape for whatever reason. He doesn't even have any other ice types, and it's not like the defense boost does much for Bundle as it gets one shot by Drain Punch. Or it would have if Okie Dogie wasn't paralyzed. And then Delibot goes for another snowscape, which obviously fails, since it uses it last turn. I really need someone to explain the AI to me. Drain Punch. But next up is Iron Jugulus, who is not only a flying type, having a super effective move for Okie Dogie, but is also a special attacker, taking advantage of his weaknesses. I honestly don't know why this isn't the first Pokemon Churro sent out after Iron Hands. I figure we can stand for at least one move, as a super effective air slash does a lot, and then Okie Dogie remains paralyzed. 
Now, switching would have been the sensible option here, but along with the flying type, Iron Jugulus is also a dark type, meaning it has the advantage on Monkey Dory, who likely can't one-shot. And unfortunately, Ogopon has taken too much damage to get in safely, so sorry Okidogi, despite your design being somewhat uncomfortable, you are probably by far the most consistent Pokemon this run. No physical attacker could stand in your way. Our barbaric Broccoli enraged at having a property destroyed comes into a obliterate Iron Jugulus with a single Ivy Cudgel. And finally it's the Big Iron Valiant. Ogopon has no interest doing any more busy work, so she brings out her lackey who's been slacking on the 4 times weak Brick Break. Whether it was seeing all of his friends die around him, a true inspiration from deep within his heart to do better, or the overwhelming intensity of Ogopon's aura radiating from her Pokeball, Monkey Dory tanks the Psycho Cut, hitting back with an unboosted, super effective Psychic, getting the one shot, ending Iron Valiant, and the Nuzlocke. And thus, Ogopon takes over Chura's body as a vessel to transcend from this world, allowing us to live another day in peace. I'm really starting to run out of ways to end my Scarlet and Violet videos. In short, Pheasantipsy has a great defensive typing and amazing ability, setting it apart from other defensive Pokemon, but it really is just a one-trick pony. You basically only use this Pokemon to Toxic Stall as its offensive capabilities are lacking. Other Pokemon can probably work the support role better. Monkey Dory, while not appearing much in this video, is quite good. It's speedy, has a massive special attack, and gets nasty plot, the only thing really holding it back being its pause hyping and limited coverage. You can still get a sweep on any teams that don't resist your stabs. Okie Doki is a physical wall and possibly the best suited for this game. If your opponent is a physical attacker and doesn't have psychic moves, it probably can't do anything to him with a combination of bulk up and drain punch and its amazing coverage. Probably the most ban worthy out of the trio. And Ogopon is hilariously broken. On top of getting min max stats for a physical attacker, has a 100 base power move with an increased crit chance, which type changes based on the mask she's holding, and her masks give her a free 20% boost to all of her Attacks. The Hard Flame Mask giving her the ability Mold Breaker to ignore abilities being the cherry on top. Ban, Banish, Exile, Extradite, she's definitely pirated a movie before. A short and easy one this time, but I thought I'd give them a try since I don't really see myself using them for any other reason. And this kind of covers my legendary only run for these games, as the actual legendary quartet doesn't really need me showcasing just how overpowered they are. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing, and I hope you look forward to more videos in the future.